Paul was completing the final preparations for the most significant celebration of his life. His wedding. He meticulously secured cufflinks adorned with tiny diamonds and adjusted the golden pin on his tie. The 30-year-old lawyer, Paolo Schatz, presented himself impeccably with his dark eyes and black hair, showcasing his handsome features and rugged chin. The illustrious princely surname had been passed down from his Georgian father, George, who had departed from his young wife, Dolores, and their child shortly after Paul's birth. The parents of the prince, products of Soviet times, considered themselves a prestigious match. And right from the start, they opposed George's choice. Despite Paul's immense love for his mother, and respect for his father, he stood his ground and ventured on his own path without parental blessing. When Paul entered the world, Dolores couldn't dedicate as much attention to the proud Georgian boy as she had before. Guga, also known as Georgie or George Vovi, initially became sad, then bored, and eventually requested leave to his hometown with the incredibly unusual name, Main Sky. He went to visit his mom and dad but never returned. Instead of Guga, Dolores received a copy of the divorce certificate in the mail, along with a package. In it, the young mother found a bag of walnuts, mandarins, a gold necklace with malachite and diamonds, and equally rare earrings with a ring. The set looked exquisite. There was also a letter from her former mother-in-law, Tamarco, in which she asked for forgiveness from her daughter-in-law. Tamarco justified her cruelty toward her son and grandson, with life circumstances and confessed that George's divorce was forced. The initiator of the process was his own mother. It turned out that in Georgia, Tamarco had already found a suitable family for him. In terms of status and financial position, although discussing princely lineage, in the early 90s was at least absurd. The Shad's family considered themselves true. Descendants of Georgian rulers. Tamako wrote that George had greatly impressed the daughter of a wealthy neighbor. She became infatuated with the young man and demanded him as her husband from her father. In return, the in-laws bought the young couple a huge mansion in Saisai and deposited a simply staggering amount into their account. For the next 17 years, the Shadavat princes dutifully sent money to Dolores. A very decent sum. She initially considered refusing, but then reasoned that financial support from her. Georgian in-laws could help raise her son, provide him with a good education, and cover expenses for clubs and sports sections. Dolores possessed a strong character, instilled by her father, Mato Rubio, a military doctor and lieutenant in the medical service. From childhood, he taught her discipline and the ability to withstand any difficulties life might throw her way. Neither George nor his family were seen again, but life showed that this didn't mean they wouldn't interfere in her only son's life. She hid the jewelry for Paolo's future wife and his children. When her son turned 25 and fell in love seriously for the first time, Mari entered his life. Describing Mari as beautiful would be an understatement. Her snow-white hair, elegantly styled sky-blue eyes, perfect facial features, and the figure of a graceful statuette could captivate anyone. Being half Georgian, young Shads was undoubtedly smitten. One day, Paolo came with friends to a small private gallery, hosting a joint exhibition of young artists. Three works struck him with their depth and unique presentation. Looking at the authorship, he asked his friend, Sergei, do you know who this is? Clearly distant from paintings and artists. Sergei yawned and replied, Ah! What? 
Ah. Is that Mari? Not very well. Julia is friends with her. So what? Paolo decided to buy a couple of masterpieces. From this young talent and requested an introduction. Julia was summoned. And Mariana Velasco soon stood before Paolo. Emitting a light that seemed to radiate on a physical level. Mariana. Or Mari as Paolo affectionately called her. Smiled. And the semi-prince Paolo Shads Montero found himself enchanted. They quickly discovered common interests. And as the official message put it. Mari and Paolo shared a high percentage of common ground. Both loved historical films. FF music. Fish in any form. Cheese and dry red wine. Ice skating. And simply living life to the fullest. Mariana lived alone. Raised by her aunt. As her parents had passed away when she was 14. Her maternal aunt. Sylvia VZ. Was a cheerful. Active. And very human woman. Despite being in her 50s. Sylvia didn't particularly stand out in terms of beauty. But her plump lips. Lush black hair down to her waist. An incredible charisma gave her a charm that could outshine any beauty. Sylvia also adored and knew how to cook better than any chef. Over the years. She collected various recipes and cooked incredible delicacies from them. Believing in the age-old saying that the way to. A person's heart is through their stomach. One of her admirers was particularly persistent, wealthy, and had a good sense of humor. He could send Sylvia a bouquet of magnificent and expensive roses in a huge iron bucket or a range. A real concert under her balcony at night. Inviting folk musicians. Initially, neighbors tried to express their feelings about such barbarism through grand and mighty swear words. But the musicians played so well that the concert eventually became a household event. Hence, the valuable prize in the form of Sylvia fell into the hands of David Esteban Guerrero. He took his wife to the USA, where he had long established business and a large house, leaving the excellent three-room apartment in the city center solely to her niece. However, she hadn't managed to transfer ownership to Mariana. Just two months later, they moved in together and filed an application with the registry office. They lived in Mariana's apartment. As she had invited Paolo herself, it was more convenient for her. And one of the rooms was turned into a studio by the artist. Secondly, Paolo didn't want to inconvenience his mother and Mari wouldn't have moved to the two-bedroom flat in an old building with him and his mom. The apartment left by the aunt had high ceilings, decent square meters. And besides, the building was located almost next to the theater, which was also important to Mariana. Paolo felt like the happiest person in the world. Practically flying, Dolores took a liking to Mariana right away and fully accepted her son's choice. When Paolo and Mari came for their blessing, Dolores crossed them with an icon and then opened a chest, taking out ancient jewelry that she had kept all these years. Here, Mariana, this is for you. This is a family relic of the Shad's princess. And soon you will become a princess too, she said, smiling as she handed the future bride a box with a necklace and a ring with earrings. The girl cautiously took the present in her hands and her breath caught. But this is, this is an exact copy of the set that Sappho Kant had. It was even named after her creation. Beautiful Helen Sunshine. Who is that? Surprised. Mariana asked. Dolores replied. My short-term mother-in-law was named Tamarco. Not Sofia Sonora Rubio. She's a Georgian artist. Though not as famous as. For example. 
Niko Safranov. Mainly because she lived at the end of the previous century. Exactly the same set is depicted in one of her portraits. Helen of Troy is portrayed in it. Yes. That one. And she's wearing this exact set. Sappho had no relatives. At least that's what the newspapers wrote shortly before her death in the 40s. Right after the war, Kant donated the set to the Georgian National Museum in Tbilisi. However, a month later, the jewelry mysteriously disappeared. And there were no signs of a break-in. It seemed as if the necklace and the earring ring had simply vanished into thin air. Everything was in a special container under glass. So the container remained intact. But there was nothing inside. They never found it. With his mouth open from curiosity, Paolo asked. Couldn't someone have made a replica of it? Dolores, almost in reverent horror, examined the incredibly beautiful ring and earrings. The latter were a long, elongated diamond-shaped piece made of bright green malachite with patterns. And tiny diamonds ran along the edges of the decoration. The clasp was also adorned with diamonds. No. Even though the capital specialists were involved in the investigation. The set vanished without a trace. So what? Mari? Maybe my grandma was so impressed by this painting. Or this decoration that she simply copied it. And asked some jeweler to make a replica. Paolo pondered. Maybe. But if this is your family heirloom. Then who and when made a copy of it? A hushed silence settled among them. And collectively. They decided not to delve further into it. After all. The idea of the Georgian princess Tamarco Shad stealing. A set from the country's main museum on tiptoes seemed like. An epic scene from a historical drama. Imagining the theft of historical jewelry by. His own grandmother made Paolo chuckle. The next day. Mari called her aunt, who became overjoyed for her niece. She insisted that Mariana must come. For a week to collect the wedding gift. Sonora Vargas. Mari's aunt. Explained that she couldn't come herself. As Senor Esteban's anniversary was approaching. And everything needed to be prepared. Being busy providing for their small but close-knit family. Aunt Sylvia agreed to cover all the costs of Mariana's trip. Mari couldn't refuse her only blood relative. And two days later, she flew to Washington, taking the ornament with her to show the immigrant jewelers, and find out if it was the same set. Upon arrival, she called Paolo, assuring him that everything was fine. And the next day she was going to visit. A former Oatsite named Solomon Schneider, whose grandfather had made the beautiful Helen. In 1900, two days later, Sonora Vargas called Paolo's number and burst into tears. Paolo felt a cold wave sweep over him, understanding that something terrible had happened, but not comprehending the extent of the tragedy. Mariana was no longer with them. She had died in a car accident. Sylvia barely managed to convey the devastating news. Paolo was paralyzed with shock. Unable to fathom the depth of the tragedy. Mari's death resulted from a terrorist attack. And it was her taxi that was returning from the jeweler. The ornament fell out of the car window during the explosion. With only the ring missing. Sylvia sobbed promising to compensate Paolo and arranging for Mariana's funeral in Washington. Paolo managed to inquire about the funeral details and compensation. And Sylvia assured him that everything would be arranged in three days. Overwhelmed. Paolo hung up. Unable to process the shocking information. He called his mother. Asking her to pick him up from Mariana's house. As staying there was beyond his strength. Ludwig, a huge gray cat, was placed in a carrier. 
and Paolo grabbed a bottle of whiskey from the bar. Pouring himself a full glass. He downed it in one gulp without any nibbles. Dolores. Also in shock. Arrived at Mariana's house. Mariana's delicate lace wedding dress hung on her shoulders. And a tiara lay nearby. Sonora Rubio carefully packed the dress and the ornament into a box. Putting it in the closet. She did all of this on autopilot. Holding herself together for the sake of her son. Paolo. However. Completely fell apart. Finishing a bottle of American moonshine in almost an hour. He collapsed onto the couch without undressing. In his disoriented state. He had a strange dream that would haunt him regularly. Over the following five years. Mariana appeared in Paolo's dreams standing on a high mountain. Beside a beautiful dark-haired woman in a sparkling dress. The woman held a set of emeralds in her hands. Set in gold. Which she then handed over to Mariana. In the dream. She spoke to Paolo. I'm alive. Paolo. I'm alive. You should live for me. You'll find me by the ring. And believe that everything will be fine. Struggling to wake up. Paolo heard his mother's voice urging him to get ready for a trip. As he packed his things and called a taxi. The funeral for Mariana took place quietly. As she had no friends in the States. Sylvia gave Paolo the family relic. And without looking. He put the box with the jewelry into his backpack. Returning to his hometown. Paolo fell into a deep depression. Concerned about his mental state. His friends sent Julia Flores. Who had introduced him to Mariana. Though Julia had initially stepped aside. When Paolo chose Mari as his girlfriend. She had always held a favorable impression of him. Paolo slowly began to recover. Five years later. He and Julia filed a marriage application. During this time. Paolo graduated from university. Opened his own law firm. And established connections not only in the business world. But also among law enforcement agencies. He earned a reputation as a smart and honest lawyer. Refusing cases involving obvious fraud or scoundrels. There were. Of course. Unconventional situations. Once. A former classmate working as a police detective called him. To defend a young woman accused of a series of thefts from jewelry stores. Paolo was surprised by the request and sought answers from aid. The detective. Paolo suspected something personal. And it turned out he was right. Aid had fallen for the suspect. Kate. Who was. Indeed. Guilty. Paolo was hesitant. Given his principles. But Aid pleaded for help. Explaining that Kate promised to quit if she could avoid prison. Paolo came to Aid's house in the evening. And it was revealed that Kate had striking emerald eyes. Raven wing hair. A Greek nose. And high cheekbones. She looked stunning. Aid explained that she had already served time. And would receive the full package if convicted again. Paolo. Shocked. Questioned Aid's intentions. Warning him of the dangers. Aid was adamant about helping Kate leave the criminal life. Fearing for her safety within the system. Despite the risks. Paolo agreed to take on the case. And successfully dismantled the prosecution's version. Kate left the courtroom with a three-year suspended sentence. Aid. Disenchanted with the police force. Resigned. And he and Kate left together. However. Three months later. Paolo learned a heartbreaking truth. Aid and Kate. The green-eyed beauty were found shot point-blank on a highway near the border. It dawned on Paolo that Kate, far from quitting her criminal pursuits, had drawn aid into her dark affairs. This tragic incident reinforced Paolo's vow never to 
Defend clients with clear criminal tendencies. Even if requested by his own mother. Looking at himself in the mirror. Paolo suddenly realized he hadn't bought his favorite cigarettes. Hurrying to the metro station near his house. He noticed a woman lying on a bench who seemed vaguely familiar. To his shock. It was Mariana. Or an exact copy of her. An impossibility in itself. Paolo tried to wake her. But she showed hardly any signs of life. Concerned. He called for an ambulance and waited for the medics. Asking which hospital they would take a patient without documents to. Paolo gave Mariana's name and surname. Intending to sort it out later. Rushing to the marriage registry without informing Julia. The celebration went smoothly. Except for Julia's occasional strange looks. And concerned inquiries about Paolo's well-being. After the ceremony. Paolo rushed to the hospital to check on the woman he had saved. Who strangely resembled Mariana. At the hospital. He identified himself as her failed husband. Prince Shads. The doctor allowed him to see her briefly and informed him. That she had experienced a simple fainting spell. Paolo was shocked to see her well-groomed hands. And the same perfect face as five years ago. In Mariana's room. Paolo noticed her transparent face and emaciated arms. But her well-groomed appearance puzzled him. When Mariana opened her eyes, tears streamed down her face, and she began sobbing. The doctor and nurse rushed in, accusing Paolo of erratic behavior, and administering an injection to Mariana, erasing her memories, watching Mariana in distress. Memories flooded back to Paolo, their moments together, their kisses on the grass, running hand in hand, filing a marriage application. It all passed before his eyes like a documentary film. Julia called, informing him about their honeymoon trip to Lake Bowles. Paolo, lacking the desire to argue after Mariana's death, decided to go along with it. Julia, a girl with a tan, black curls, and black eyes, was great, and Paolo could talk to her about anything. However, when he saw Mariana, all doubts vanished. His heart raced, realizing that Julia was beautiful, but she wasn't his woman. The love of his life lay under the foredrip, and only she knew what had happened to her. Not going to the registry office with Julia would be sheer callousness after five years. She had pulled him out of depression, fed him, watered him, supported him, saved his nerves. But the horror was that he didn't love Julia Flores. He respected her, was grateful, wanted her as a woman, but he didn't love her. At least that's what he was thinking right now. The realization that Paolo had made a mistake came right after he found Mariana. But what to do with this realization? Shads didn't know. He decided to tell his wife everything. Julia listened. Her eyes wide and her mouth open. Are you sure it's Mariana? You buried her yourself. I'm sure. And the coffin was buried closed. If you remember. She's been appearing in my dreams for the past five years. Saying she's alive. I think something unusual happened. And Mari didn't die. She got into trouble. We'll have to wait until she fully recovers. And now. What are you going to do? Divorce me? Julia unexpectedly asked. Lowering her head. Paolo felt ashamed of his selfishness. He didn't even try to hide his genuine interest in the resurrected Mariana. However, he had become so accustomed to Julia's role over the years, seeing her as both a mother and a caregiver, that he didn't think of her at that moment as a woman. Come on. Julia. We've been together for so many years. We're husband and wife. 
He embraced his friend and patted her head. Don't cry. We just need to help Mariana. She has no one here. And her aunt has no idea she's alive. Once she recovers, we'll have to inform Sylvia. He said this only to calm his innocent wife. He said it and understood that the beginning of their official family life could now be considered its finale. But not now. Not right after the wedding. It's just impossible. Julia stopped sobbing and buried her face in her husband's chest. You had such a look in your eyes. I was so scared. I thought that was it. Paolo left his phone number with the attending doctor. And three days later, the hospital called him. The doctor said that Mariana had regained consciousness and asked him to come. Paolo dropped everything and rushed to the hospital without telling Julia. Mariana was sitting on the bed, smiling sadly. Hello. Mari. It really is you. It's me. Paolo. Don't rush me. I'll tell you everything. But gradually. Mariana gathered her thoughts and courage. I'm not an artist. Paolo. Well. I do draw. Of course. But I'm not an artist. I'm a private investigator. Yes. Yes. Don't look at me like that. I have an arts education and have exhibitions. But I make a living doing something else. I have a small private agency. I opened it six months before I met you. But I kept this fact hidden for various reasons. My parents worked in the police in a special department investigating serious crimes, searching for historical values, missing documents of high significance for the state, people. Of course, I wasn't allowed access to classified documents, but I learned the principles of detective work by being around my parents. They died in a car crash while searching for a unique set of jewelry. But I don't think their death was accidental. Most likely, they were eliminated. As they say in detective series, Mariana took a sip of mineral water from a glass on the nightstand and looked up at Paolo. This jewelry, Paolo, was called Beautiful Elena and belonged to SFO Contra. It disappeared many years ago. I told you the truth. But a month before I met you, a woman came to my agency. She said she was SFO's great-granddaughter and wanted to find the missing Malachite. When I asked her how, she said she had a plan, but she'd only share her thoughts with me if I took an advanced fee for the work and agreed to take on the investigation. My curiosity was piqued, and when this woman named her fee, my interest in the case acquired a more practical form. How much did she offer? 500 euros. 000. zero, zero. She gave me 250 euros. Zero, zero, zero in cash at the embassy. And I hid the money. But it's not just about the money. I was intrigued. And it was my first major case. If I could have foreseen how this could end. I would have shown that lady the door without a second thought. Along with her money. She told me that there might have been two sets. The original and a very good copy. The copy was made by a jeweler whose first work dated back to 1900. As I told you before. Before SFO's death. She donated her set to a museum. After that. It disappeared. And here's where it gets interesting, in the 1940s. There was a copy in the museum. Not the original. The real beautiful Elena had been in your family all these years. Your great-great-grandmother, after remarrying, took the Schneider surname. And Paolo. Mariana continued. This is a family relic. And it's time you learn the full story. She lived in America. And before leaving, she gave the case containing the jewelry to her daughter Tamako Shaga. 
so did the great-great-grandfather of that American jeweler too. Whom you took the jewelry for appraisal swapped the set. But how? What? Why didn't you tell me anything right away? I don't understand. I just didn't have the chance. It didn't work out right away. And now? Imagine. In my state when you gave me the beautiful Elena as a wedding gift. I didn't know what to think. All sorts of thoughts came to mind. And then I remembered that the client mentioned. The Schneider jewelers who had immigrated. To the USA in the early 20th century. I contacted the lady. Asked her to talk to her husband. After all. He's an entrepreneur and has been living in America for a long time. And Uncle David really helped. He found contact information for Solomon Schneider. I took the set with me and flew to the States. What happened next? And where were you all these five years? Mari. I went to Solomon. Showed him the set. He got excited. Noticeably nervous. Then offered me coffee with brandy. I had a drink. And I don't remember anything else. I woke up alone in a hospital room. Turns out. Paolo. It was a very exclusive mental institution in the USA. No. In our homeland. They didn't want to take any risks. What if I ran to my aunt? But how did you get out of there? And wait. If it was about the Malachite. And they sent you to the loony bin. And the jewelry was stolen. What did they pass on to your aunt and then to my mom? True. There were no rings. And who was buried instead of you? Schneider brought a copy to my aunt. One that disappeared from the museum in 1940. I don't know where the ring is. Maybe it got lost. It turns out the jewelry was taken from the museum by a tour guide. The husband of your great-grandmother's niece. So, the Schneider family ended up with both the copy and the original. The lady gave to Tam Rico. Your grandmother. And she took the copy with her to America. A little later. Her husband asked what happened to another set. And she confessed that she gave it to her daughter. Who stayed in our homeland. There was an uproar. But returning the set that remained in. Soviet Georgia was no longer possible. They weren't exactly mobsters. Just regular swindlers. Of course. All the male members of the Schneider family knew this story. And that's when my aunt's husband. Senor Esteban. Found him. He brought a photo of the set and asked. If he could appraise the jewelry and provide a description. Can you imagine his state? He extracted all the details from Uncle David. Assured him he'd do everything properly. And started waiting for me. He and his son had already decided everything about me. If the Malachite is genuine. They plan to put me in a mental institution. On medication for a couple of months. Stage a false funeral. And that's it. I'd be gone. Who would believe a homeless woman? Without documents after an official burial. And for added assurance of their innocence in my death. They even handed over the copy that they had kept all these years. Well. Handed over is a strong word. They left it near a wrecked car. Who was there? No one. The car was empty. And they probably buried an empty coffin or some nameless pauper. So. You spent five years in a mental institution. Of course not. When all the commotion settled down. They let me go. They even issued new documents. I've been Maria Cruz for almost five years now. A simple name. Inconspicuous. But how did you find out all this? You won't believe it. When I regained consciousness in the clinic. They brought me a cell phone. And after a while. It rang. It was Schneider. He told me everything. Not hiding or hesitating about anything. I think he did it because the coffin with my supposed. 
remains was already in the ground. And I was far from home and my grave in the USA. So, in case anything happened, they would just send me back to the loony bin. Wow. Paolo could only say. I lived in a monastery for a while. Then I found a job and rented a place. I recently returned to our city. The thing is. After being drugged up in America. They somehow transported me to a provincial town. Who knows why they chose that specific town. Maybe they had some connections there. When I barely got out of that institution. With a new passport and 500 euros in my pocket. Which the Schneiders generously gave me. I was disoriented in space. Of course. They didn't give me a mobile phone. I could have called my aunt or you. I sat on a bench. And the mother superior of the monastery came and sat next to me. She looked at me and, without asking anything, said. Well. Come with me. You'll live with us at the monastery. Nobody will bother you there. You can tell everything there. And we went. I didn't really have a choice. I barely understood what was happening at all. She brought me to a women's monastery. I rested in a cell. And Sister Evangeline nursed me with some herbs. Finally. I started to think clearly. Remembered everything that happened to me. And I also remembered that I had been buried. Before I could come back to life. I needed to figure out what kind of mess this was. Why they drugged me. And then tried to get rid of me. But I had no money. No connections. No support whatsoever. So. I decided to leave things as they were for now and live in the monastery. After all. The Lord had sent me Evangeline for a reason. In my state. I could have encountered anyone. I told my story to the Mother Superior. You really can't reveal yourself right now. Live here. I'll tell the Abbess that you're a distant relative of mine. Then we'll figure something out. Mariana eventually fully regained her strength. And asked Sister Evangeline if they had paints. Paper or even pencils. The nun asked why. And when she found out that Mariana was an artist and a restorer. She was very pleased. The monastery's archives contained many. Icons in need of restoration and repair. To paint icons. She needed permission from the monastery's higher. Authorities and their blessing. But Mariana was content with even this. God himself sent you to us exclaimed Evangeline. Well, who sent whom to whom is still uncertain. Mariana said sadly. For years went by this way. During that time, Mariana got involved in icon painting, feeling content within the monastery's walls. However, she still had her family, and living under a false name was something she no longer wanted. She needed to take action. To step out of the darkness. Consulting with Evangeline. She received approval for her decision to try to fix the situation. Evangeline gave Mariana some money for the journey and the initial period. Mariana bought a train ticket. Sharing the same compartment with a woman and her small child. It didn't cross Mariana's mind to suspect anything sinister. The woman shared her story of escaping from her tyrant husband. Recounting tales of abuse. Mariana listened and nodded. Deciding not to reveal anything about herself. During her years in the monastery. Mariana had grown used to interacting with ordinary people. She mostly stayed in her workshop or cell. Helping with household chores and maintaining the status of a laborer. The work wasn't paid by the monastery. So Mother Superior helped Mariana with money from her own pocket. As the train journey continued with the monotonous rhythm of the wheels, Mariana fell asleep. When she woke up, her unfortunate neighbor and her daughter were nowhere to be seen, assuming they left while she was sleeping. 
Mariana reached into her bag for some money to buy something to eat. To her dismay, her wallet was missing. And a note on the table apologized. It was clear that her neighbor took the money. Left with only 50 cents in change. Mariana bought a bottle of water for the entire journey. Fasting had become a habit. And she could stretch the few candies and pastries she had over two days. When she reached the city center. Unexpectedly. Mariana suddenly collapsed on a bench. At the moment when Paolo. Running past. Spotted her. He sat down and stared at Mariana without taking his eyes off her. Then he asked. Where did you hide the money? In the attic. In an old trunk with the old photographs in your mom's apartment. Where? Oh my god. Mariana. What if mom had found that money? Can you even imagine what she would have thought? She might have thought I robbed a bank. Paolo smiled. But in five years. We've never once gone up to those attics. So the money is there. Let's do this, they're discharging you in three weeks. I'll find the money during that time and rent an apartment for you. You need somewhere to live. And you won't get into your apartment if your aunt hasn't sold it. Or at all. And we're flying together to KSKY. I think it's time for me to have a talk with Grandma Tamarco. But what about Julia? You two just got married. Julia is going on an internship to England. What do you think she'll choose? A Georgian village or London? I feel awkward. Paolo. It doesn't seem right. Listen to me. Julia is doing fine now. She has a great. Well-paying job. The status of a married woman. Money. She doesn't need my or anyone else's help. But you have no one here except me and my mother. And you really need support and assistance. I can't tell my mother anything for understandable reasons. So, it's just me. Mariana. We're not strangers. It's awkward when you can help a good person. But you don't. That's it. It's decided. Of course. Paolo was being deceptive. It wasn't just about his desire and noble urge to help a good person. It turned out that he hadn't fallen out of love with Mariana. He felt it with every cell of his body. The pain had subsided. The emotional wounds had healed. But he remembered Mari. She often visited him in his dreams. Yes. They hadn't known each other well probably hadn't really gotten to know each other. But Mariana was his woman. Unique and irreplaceable for a lifetime. Like Helen of Troy for Paris. Julia was more like a friend. He enjoyed being with her in bed. But his feelings didn't blind him. The sensation of flight didn't pursue Paolo with her like it did with Mariana. When Dolores went to work the next day, Paolo climbed up to the attic. The small brown suitcase sat forlornly in the corner. Covered in dust. Paolo reached up and pulled down the luggage from the attic ladder. Getting covered in dust in the process. He wiped the suitcase with a damp cloth and opened it. On top were black and white photos that captured his parents young and happy. Some people Paolo had never seen before. He lifted the photos and found several bundles of five. 000 banknotes secured with a rubber band. Quickly, Paolo collected all the bundles and put them into a specially prepared box. Then, he dialed the number of a real estate agency where his colleague worked as a lawyer and asked him to find something decent. A two-room apartment with a large kitchen. But not in the city center. Preferably in an expensive residential area free from close neighbors or rowdy foreigners, troublemakers, overly cheerful neighbors, and sudden water outages. Oops. Did you get yourself a mistress? Well done. You handsome guy. You just got married. After all, 
Although you've been living with Julia for a while now, there's probably a certain weariness from each other. Right? Cut the nonsense. A client approached me with this request. He has some relatives visiting. But his wife doesn't want to see any paupers on her precious squares. As she put it. Let alone entertain them. Paupers? But where did the money for elite housing come from? Then. The client isn't poor. He has money. He's the one calling the shots. All right. Then. I'll find something. Bring your lady with you. Said the friend with a chuckle. Idiot. Paolo thought irritably and went home. Not forgetting to discreetly put the suitcase back in the attic. Without the secret. He locked the door carefully and left. His half-naked wife was rushing around the house. Packing her fifth suitcase. Julia. For heaven's sake. Where are you going with all that? You can buy things in London. They have seasonal sales all the time. It's cheaper than in our capital. By the way. Many people from the capital purposely fly there to buy brand name items. Paolo. I'm going for half a year. I took autumn clothes and jackets. It's cold in England. By the way. And there are fogs there too. And no one will see you through that natural curtain with your fur coat. And in the fog. They'll mistake you for some Canterbury ghost or Jack the Ripper. Why Jack the Ripper? Am I that scary looking? Julia. In her underwear with fashionable, multicolored. Rollers in her hair and one fluffy slipper. Looked so endearing that Paolo couldn't resist and grabbed his wife. Lifting her up and twirling her around the room. Not Jack. But, Geely the Ripper because you're like possessed. Ripping through all the stores. They packed their things. Loaded them into the car. And headed to the airport. Where two more colleagues who were lucky enough. To be included were already waiting for Julia. The girls chatted away. And Julia. After quickly kissing her husband on the nose. Scampered off. She could easily switch from one thing to another. Especially when it came to unpleasant or problematic situations. Julia had quickly pushed the thought of the possible loss of. Her husband due to the resurrection of his first fiancé out of her mind. Interestingly. She hadn't even once asked Paolo to take her to Mariana. Or shown the slightest interest in her fate. Paolo immediately went to the agency. Paid for the apartment for three months. And received the keys. Mariana's new home was indeed in a decent part of the city. Two decent rooms furnished with high-quality furniture. And a large wall-mounted TV. The luxurious bathroom had a jacuzzi. Paolo understood that Mariana had probably grown accustomed to such luxury. And yet he knew she had never really welcomed these. Bijo joys. As she called them. Mari had a refined taste. She was more drawn to the aesthetic aspects of life. But Paolo wanted to delight her. Afterward. He went shopping. Buying clothes and everything she needed. Including groceries. He remembered Mariana's size perfectly. Over these years. The girl had not gained weight but had become even slimmer. It made sense. The monastic life wasn't conducive to rich meals. Although they knew how to cook there. Paolo had once been to a monastery for work on Easter. A novice was accused of stealing church utensils. But the young man clearly wasn't involved and was simply framed. They invited him to the table. And the variety of dishes overwhelmed Paolo's eyes. Everything was delicious. After moving everything to Mariana's new home. Paolo went to the hospital to pick her up. He helped her into the car. And they set off on their journey. Mariana stared out of the window. Amazed at how much the city had changed in just five years. Many streets were hardly recognizable. And new little shops. Pharmacies. 
and bars had appeared. Soon, they arrived at the right address. Paolo escorted Mariana to the apartment, opened the door, and said, Here we are. Make yourself at home. Mariana kicked off her shoes, walked into the room, and saw clothes hanging on hangers. Bags with various items that would make life more comfortable and cozy. Is all of this for me? Of course. Thank you. I'll head to the bathroom. Then, having been in a real bathtub for ages, the young woman smiled while she splashed around. Paolo set the table. And they sat down to dinner. Just like in the good old days. After a couple of glasses of wine, Mariana started to doze off. Paolo lifted her up, laid her on the couch, and settled on a small bench in the kitchen. He woke up early, before six o'clock in the morning, and Mariana was already brewing coffee. The divine aroma spread through the apartment. How long have you been up? Monasteries rise early. The routine there is stricter than in the army. What are we going to do next? I booked two tickets to Green Cape. Tomorrow. We're flying to Georgia. Granny doesn't know that we're coming. But I have the address. I haven't told my mom yet that you're alive. I only said that I wanted to visit my father's homeland. See my grandmother if she's alive. Mom didn't object. Green Cape. Where's that? Why do we need to go there? We were planning to go to M. Connie. That is. Green Cape. Just translated into our language. The day passed in a flurry of activity. Paolo visited his mother. Then his own place. Packed for the trip. But beforehand. He asked to see the set of jewelry that Sylvia had passed to him after Mariana's false death. Why? Dolores. Was surprised. I want to take a photo of them and ask Grandma. How exactly they ended up with these. Remember when Mariana was still alive. She told the legend of the set that disappeared. From the museum before the war. She was surprised how this rarity could end up with us. Well. I mean. The Shaga family. Why are you suddenly remembering this? Oh. Just because I'm going back to the historical homeland. Mom. Paolo smiled. However. It seemed Dolores had suspicions. She was. After all. A mother and knew her only son well. Lately. She had noticed some oddities in her son but attributed them to his recent marriage. After all, for any man, marriage is a significant step. Paolo quickly photographed the jewelry, hugged his mother, and hurried away. The next day, he and Mariana boarded the plane and, after a few hours, found themselves in sunny Caucasus Mosquit. It was a small Georgian village located 8 kilometers from Batumi. No one would have known about this village. If it weren't for the famous Batumi Botanical Garden. And the magnificent pebble beach with crystal clear water. 200 years ago. This village was a beloved vacation spot for Russian nobility. Merchants. And industrialists. Old Russians built houses and summer cottages here so that their grandchildren and great-grandchildren could also enjoy the sun, sea, and fruits. However, the revolution and the subsequent Soviet rule shattered all those plans. By constructing their own, private wealthy homes were turned into sanatoriums and vacation homes for the working class. In the mid-20th century, even a cable car was built here connecting the beach with the sanatoriums on the hills. Then came the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Georgia gained independence from the USSR. The symbol of progress, the cable car, turned into ordinary rusty junk. 
Paolo double-checked the address. And he and Mariana got into a taxi. The cheerful driver hummed and told stories throughout the short drive. Laughing contagiously. Their passengers' moods noticeably improved. And they began to smile back. Soon. They arrived at a large. Beautiful house. Paolo and Mariana paid the fare. Exited the car. And headed towards the house. An elderly woman sat in the gazebo with a cup of coffee. And a small smoking pipe from which she emitted fragrant smoke. Seeing the guests. She stood up and walked towards the gate. Who are you here to see? Paolo was about to introduce himself. But the mansion's owner suddenly stared at him with wide eyes. Oh my god. This can't be. Paolo. Is that you? If you're Tamriko's grandson. Then yes. It's me. Paolo. Come in. Why are you standing there? Come in. Vang. Come here immediately. Quickly. Tam Arcio. Why are you shouting like a peacock? I'm coming. What happened? From the garden emerged a colorful elderly man. He looked like a classic Georgian. Tall. Stately. With a distinctive hooked nose. Black eyes. And a completely gray head. Meet Vang. This is your eldest grandson. Paolo. Pavo. Oh my god. It can't be. He repeated. Echoing his wife. Hustle and bustle began under the grapevine. They started setting up a large table. And the young couple was led to the best room on the second floor. The household members gazed at them with undisguised curiosity. They took us for a married couple. Otherwise. They wouldn't have allocated a single room for both of us. Paolo said. Looking at Mariana. We won't have to reveal all the details. So we'll have to sleep on one bed. Sorry. Mari. No problem. I've been sleeping on even harder surfaces for the past four years. But I still manage to fall asleep quite quickly. So I think I'll conk out on this mattress right away. Two hours later. They were invited to the table. There was everything imaginable. Raw and smoked ham. Lots of greens and vegetables. Large pitchers of wine. Flatbirds were baking in the tundur. And fragrant kebabs were grilling on the barbecue. At the table. Paolo and Mariana were surprised to see around 20 people. These are your relatives. Pavo. And our best friends. His grandmother explained. Hello. My name is Paolo. And this is Mariana. And so it began. The wine flowed like a river. One toast following another. This Georgian feast is called Supra. A tradition where the table is covered with a blue tablecloth. This is an ancient tradition that originated in Georgia in the 18th century. And must not be broken. The blue color was chosen for a rather mundane reason. At that time. Indigo dye was in use and freely available among few. And linen was common. The celebration is led by a supra. Usually a specially invited toastmaster. Still. Here. This role was taken by Paolo's grandfather. Vang. By the way. During large Georgian feasts. Only white wine is served as it doesn't raise blood pressure and can be consumed in larger quantities. The first toast is always for God and peace. Then for Georgia. And the third for ancestors. When the Lord was distributing land to the nations. The Georgians. As usual. Were sitting at a table feasting. After reveling to their heart's content. They finally came for their share. However. All the parcels of land had already been distributed. So. They turned to God and said. How is this possible? Almighty. 
when everyone was in line for land. We were toasting to your health. The Lord was so touched that he gave the Georgians a small, but the best piece of land. With tall mountains, swift rivers, and the purest air. And that was Georgia. How can we not raise a toast for such a gift? The feast ended well past midnight. After all the songs were sung and the most interesting stories were told. Paolo carried the quite tipsy Mariana to their shared room, helped her take off her shoes, and laid her down in bed. He settled next to her, and soon they fell asleep without realizing it. Georgian wine and the clean mountain air had worked their magic. In the morning, they were greeted by the aroma of coffee, unlike any they had ever smelled in the city. Looking out the window, Paolo saw that Tam Rico was brewing his jazz, placed in hot sand. Come out. My dears. Seeing her grandson's head sticking out of the window, Tam Rico called out. Paolo and Mariana freshened up in the modern bathroom, and went downstairs. On the table, there was a pitcher of wine and a pitcher of Aaron. A traditional yogurt-based drink. Freshly baked kachapuri. Cheese. And fruits lay nearby. Let's nurse ourselves. Do you have a headache? The hostess asked. No. Surprisingly not. Paolo said in amazement. You truly are Shigoff. Mariana asked suddenly. And then they heard his grandfather's satisfied voice behind him. I've never had a hangover either. And I could drink four pitchers like that in one evening. Vang. You might have been able to drink four pitchers like that. But it only happened twice in your life. And both times I had to call an emergency. Paolo said. Mariana. Sipping the Aaron in huge gulps. Nearly burst into laughter but held herself back. Remembering the fiery Georgian temperament and the sensitivity of the male representatives of this wonderful nationality. Ah! What are you saying? Woman! It wasn't a real emergency. Arkel and Armin came to me with a fifth pitcher of wine in it. Which we just didn't manage to finish before sunrise. We had to work in the morning. I am still a writer. After all. At this point. Both guests and hosts couldn't hold back. And they all burst into laughter together. After the laughter subsided, Tam Rico turned to her grandson. Now tell us. What brought you to our land? Do you want to see your father? Unfortunately. That's impossible. George has long immigrated to America. We communicate through video calls. But he hasn't visited us once in the 20 years since he left. Despite her age, Tam Rico didn't have a single gray hair. And her eyes were bright and insightful. Clearly indicating that she possessed a brilliant intellect. She looked at the young man so reminiscent of her George. Whom she hadn't seen for two decades. When she separated him from Paolo's mother and went to meet her husband who had dreamed of marrying their son to the daughter of a wealthy neighbor. She believed she was doing the right thing. In Georgia, it's not customary for women to contradict men. So, despite her strong will and considerable influence over her husband, Tam Rico didn't oppose the match. She didn't mind having a foreign daughter-in-law and admired Dolores's calm demeanor. Innate intelligence, practicality, and integrity. But things turned out differently. It was mostly Vang who grumbled. And he kept counting the money all those 18 years. Trying to somehow make amends for his wrongdoing towards Dolores and young Paolo. Who never got to know his father at a reasonable age. It became evident fairly quickly that Tam Rico and Tang had made a mistake. The new daughter-in-law turned out to be spoiled and hysterical. Constantly demanding something and always dissatisfied. George. Due to his gentle and pliable nature. 
quickly transformed into a classic henpecked husband. They had a daughter together. And when the country entered another nightmarish period, they sold everything they had. Within a month, they got visas and, together with the parents of George's new wife, left for America. It was there that the daughter-in-law gave birth to two more children, who essentially became Americans, thinking and holding the same peculiar values. If you could call them that, considering that George's father-in-law managed to start a business and become wealthy by American standards. His grandchildren had everything they could wish for. The Georgian grandparents were never able to lay eyes on them, leaving the elderly prince and princess Shads without a single son and grandchildren to prevent themselves from becoming too melancholic. They invited their nephews and their children to their home. The cheerful voices of the little ones and their playful antics gradually healed the emotional wounds of George's parents. However, Tam Rico felt her guilt grow stronger with each passing year. So, when she saw Paolo at her doorstep, she thanked God for the opportunity to repent before him and somehow help him. Tam Rico, there's quite a story. Mustering his courage, Paolo began to tell the youth of her name. Instead of Baba, which is what grandmothers are called in Georgia, or even a simple granny. Though it pained her heart, she understood that she couldn't be Baba yet. Right now, she was just Tam Rico. And thank God, not da. Well, it's quite a story, Paolo repeated. And with a sudden surge of determination, he laid out everything that had happened to him and Mariana over the past five years. Grandmother listened to him without interrupting, smoking a lot. This is my fault, albeit unintentional. Placing her pipe on the table, Tam Rico began the story. Mariana's story actually started in 1900. But there's more you don't know. Solomon Schneider made not just one but two copies of the jewelry set. Externally, the sets were indistinguishable. The difference was only in the rings because the second one, which later came into our possession, had a secret. Well, I'll tell you about that a bit later. Back then, in Soviet Russia, there was a gang operating in Street Petersburg that robbed jewelry stores. They used a very primitive method. A beautiful young lady would enter the shop. Choose rings or earrings. Try them on. And then run off. The owners behind the counter usually didn't have great reaction times. And the swindler, having run around the corner, would quickly put on a peasant's outfit that her accomplices were waiting with. These city folks, as they were called, even had special pockets where they would hide their stolen goods. In 1910, the Polish artists, the Pikowski troupe, arrived in Petersburg. At that time, there was an exhibition of rare diamonds in Petersburg, among which was a large Parisian pink diamond they managed to steal. Solomon Schneider, a man of keen interest, was hanging around Petersburg looking for an interesting jewelry story to reset. He caught the attention of the Pikovsky, as they called themselves in Polish, which amused the criminal community, as it had certain associations with a part of women's attire. But the jokes ended as soon as they learned about the exploits of the robbers. For them, there was only one criminal authority, Madame Cavia, and no one else. The robbers feared no one and nothing. In short, they asked Solomon to buy the diamond. It was beautiful and expensive but not worth a billion. Besides, the criminals were running out of time. Schneider bought it. But the challenge was how to get it out. The police were not stupid at that time. And after a theft, they first checked all jewelers. And Solomon was known within their circles. 
he had the second copy with him. Taking it in case a successful exchange or sale opportunity came up, he disassembled the ring in which there was a small compartment. Tam Rico lit her pipe and took a sip of coffee with Comac. And Paolo and Mari asked in one breath. I think you've guessed that Schneider. Put the Parisian diamond in the ring. And smuggled it from street. Petersburg to Georgia. Later. When my mother married him. She took the copy with the Parisian diamond. Apparently. Solomon planned to take it to the USA. Which is why he left it untouched for a while. And that's why he had such a strong reaction. When he found out that my mother. Had given these jewels to me. But where did you learn all this? Paolo asked. Already tired of being surprised over the last few days. Accidentally. You see. Being a person greedy and utterly shameless. Solomon Schneider was also very sentimental. In his youth. He dreamed of being a writer. So he kept diaries describing his affairs with women. Cleverly conducted deals. And just all sorts of nonsense. With age. He abandoned this pursuit and forgot to take the diaries. With him when he left the country. And I found them and sent them to your mother. Yes. But when Mariana supposedly died. The ring disappeared. Mariana said quietly. What do you mean? Paolo asked. I left it at your house. The necklace and earrings were in the same box. A big velvet one. And the ring. I hid it in your room. In your childhood hiding spot. Remember. You showed it to me under the floor. Oh. What a surprise. Babe. So. Is it still at our home? Grandma. A copy. The one with the ring that hides the Parisian pink diamond. The next day. Paolo and Mariana started packing to go home. Paolo approached Tam Rico. Who outwardly didn't show that her heart was breaking. Baba. Come with us for a visit. And take Grandpa with you too. Hugging Tam Rico. Paolo said. Mom will be happy. Honestly. So many years have passed. And you've helped us all these years. The coffee pot in the woman's hands trembled. And for the first time in many years. She let tears flow. She sat at the table. Covering her face with her hands. And silently cried as tears streamed down her face. I'll go. Grandson. Of course I'll go. Vang was pleased with the invitation. But he declined. Citing an unfinished novel. An unsung grape harvest. And the suffering of his beloved Labrador. Fpko. Who would surely die the day after his departure. In reality. He couldn't imagine how Dolores would react when she saw him. After all. It was he who shattered her life. Insisting on divorcing their son and practically. Pushing him into a new Kabbalistic marriage. Tam Rico understood his motive and supported her husband. Not revealing Vang's suffering. Yes. Let him stay here. We really need to take care of the house. And the grapes need to be harvested. And wine needs to be made. And that's not women's work. We can't disrupt traditions. Upon arriving, they stayed in an apartment rented for Mariana. Paolo didn't know how to tell his mother. That he brought his grandmother with him. The supposed deceased fiancé who didn't go through with it five years ago. And also that he planned to get a divorce. Intimacy hadn't happened yet between him and Mariana. She was too emotionally overwhelmed by everything happening. And Paolo was afraid of hurting her. But he also knew that sooner or later. They would be together. He was still incredibly drawn to her. As if she were a close relative. He also understood that. In order to respect himself. He needed to tell Julia about his feelings and ask her for a divorce. 
Suddenly, the phone rang. And Julia's name appeared on the screen. Well, there you go. Remember your wife. And she's calling. Yes. Julia. Hey. Paolo. How are you? Paolo answered. All right. And you? I'm not doing too well. Paolo. Well. You see. I'm pregnant. Paolo's eyes darkened. This message dashed all his plans for a happy future. Paolo. I'm sorry. But it's not your child. You know. These things happen. I fell in love. I pursued you for so long. And after finally getting you. I realized that you never truly loved me. But you never hid that. Did you? He's English. I've already filed for divorce. Wait. But when did you manage to? We've been in a relationship for three months now. He came to our town. And you didn't notice a thing. Julia. It's all fine. Why did we even have that wedding then? You should have told me right away. I'm a reasonable person. Noble husband. Julia almost shouted into the phone with an almost happy voice. I didn't know how to tell you. I thought we'll move to England. And things will naturally resolve themselves there. And I'll stay here. And you'll suggest a divorce yourself. You're not really angry. Are you? Julia sobbed on the other side of the continent. I'm happy. Paolo. Almost yelled but caught himself in time. This was all too much. Even for their villainous situation. It was like a movie mixed with Germans. A resurrected bride who died five years ago. Thousands of euros found. A regained Georgian Baba. The Parisian Diamond. And a pregnant wife. Just not with him but with some Englishman. She apparently had been seeing right under his nose. For the past few months before their wedding. Granny. Mari. What? Both his beloved women answered simultaneously. Julia filed for divorce. She's pregnant. Wait. No rush. Not with me. Mariana. Will you marry me? Oh. Shads. Mari. Replied softly. Where would I go now? Away from you. Just one condition, we'll get married not here. But in the church that saved me. Paolo gathered his courage and called Dolores. Mom. It's me. I'm home. So quickly. Weren't you planning to stay a couple of months? Did you find Tam Rico? Yes. Mom. And not just her. Mom. Julia is divorcing me. She's with another man. And she's expecting his child. What? Whose child? Probably an English lord's child. I don't know whose it will be. And I brought Tam Rico and Mari with me. Mom. She's alive. But it's a very long story. We're coming to you. When they entered the house. Dolores was as pale as a ghost. But she regained her composure. Hello. Sonora Rubio. Mari said softly. Oh my god. Darling. Dolores grabbed Mariana and held her close. Both of them finally burst into tears and. Somehow eased the tension of the situation. And here's Babwa. That's grandma in Georgia. And I remember how to say grandma in Georgian. Dolores smiled through her tears. Tam Rico. Come in. You're my only mother-in-law. Albeit X. I didn't get another one. An hour later. A table was set with wine brought from Georgia. Surprisingly. Mom and Grandma quickly found common ground. While Paolo and Mariana went to open the hiding place. The ring with malachite surrounded by tiny diamonds was indeed there. 
They took the box and brought it into the large room. Here. How does it open? We're afraid to break it. Mari said and placed the precious item on the table. Just a moment. Tam Rico replied. She took out the ring. Turned it in her hands. Pressed a button. And the ornament opened. A pink radiance burst into their eyes. Dazzling them with its incredible light. Oh my god. It's the Parisian. At that moment. The doorbell rang. Mom. Are you expecting someone? No. Who could I be waiting for? Who's there? You're flooding us. Who are we flooding? Dolores answered. Opening the door. A few seconds before that. Paolo felt danger. But it was too late. At the threshold stood Senor Esteban. Sylvia's husband. Mariana's aunt. And behind him. Two hooligans. Well. Hello there. Girls and boys too. You've done well. Especially you. Mari. How skillfully you've manipulated everyone around you. Manipulated who? What are you doing here? And where's aunt? Mariana asked. Your aunt is knitting winter hats. Even though in California. Where I bought her a small house. They're not really necessary. It's very hot there. But for a woman of her age. It's a perfect pastime. Please give me that beautiful ring with the pink stone inside. He reached out his hand. But Tam Rico managed to quickly snap the ring shut. Oh. You old scoundrel. I'll. And you'll be left empty handed. Only I can open this ring. If you try to force it open. You'll damage the stone. What's going on? Uncle David? Oh. Nothing much. Niece. The client who came to you with the order for the ring is my sister. We've been searching for this unique piece for a while. And we decided to involve some young agency to do it. Professional detectives would have figured everything out in an instant. And then we would have ended up with nothing, to get close to the ring. I even had to marry your foolish aunt. All this story with your car accident. Funeral. And mental institution was my idea. Pretty cool. Huh. I forgot to mention that before I became a businessman. I was. How can I put it mildly? The director of a criminal organization. I had a few dozen tough guys at my disposal. My own intelligence. My infantry. But most of our wonderful company ended up behind bars. I managed to escape with new documents and move to the USA. My sister was already living there. And she became a close friend to Schneider. The Jewish idiot fell so in love with Maya that he was ready for any nonsense. Well. Almost any. Unexpectedly. Mariana leaped from her spot and lunged at Uncle David like a tigress. She clawed at his face. Scratching his cheeks and then his hair. Taken by surprise. She was too emotionally overwhelmed by everything happening. And Paolo was afraid of hurting her. But he also knew that sooner or later. They would be together. He was still incredibly drawn to her. As if she were a close relative. He also understood that. In order to respect himself. He needed to tell Julia about his feelings and ask her for a divorce. Suddenly. The phone rang. And Julia's name appeared on the screen. Well. There you go. Remember your wife. And she's calling. Yes. Julia. Hey. Paolo. How are you? Paolo answered. All right. And you? I'm not doing too well, Paolo. Well. You see. I'm pregnant. Paolo's eyes darkened. This message dashed all his plans for a happy future. Paolo. 
I'm sorry. But it's not your child. You know. These things happen. I fell in love. I pursued you for so long. And after finally getting you. I realized that you never truly loved me. But you never hid that. Did you? He's English. I've already filed for divorce. Wait. But when did you manage to? We've been in a relationship for three months now. He came to our town. And you didn't notice a thing. Julia. It's all fine. Why did we even have that wedding then? You should have told me right away. I'm a reasonable person. Noble husband. Julia almost shouted into the phone with an almost happy voice. I didn't know how to tell you. I thought we'll move to England. And things will naturally resolve themselves there. And I'll stay here. And you'll suggest a divorce yourself. You're not really angry. Are you? Julia sobbed on the other side of the continent. I'm happy. Paolo. Almost yelled but caught himself in time. This was all too much. Even for their villainous situation. It was like a movie mixed with Germans. A resurrected bride who died five years ago. Thousands of euros found. A regained Georgian Baba. The Parisian Diamond. And a pregnant wife. Just not with him but with some Englishman. She apparently had been seeing right under his nose. For the past few months before their wedding. Granny. Mari. What? Both his beloved women answered simultaneously. Julia filed for divorce. She's pregnant. Wait. No rush. Not with me. Mariana. Will you marry me? Oh. Shads. Mari. Replied softly. Where would I go now? Away from you. Just one condition, we'll get married not here. But in the church that saved me. Paolo gathered his courage and called Dolores. Mom. It's me. I'm home. So quickly. Weren't you planning to stay a couple of months? Did you find Tam Rico? Yes. Mom. And not just her. Mom. Julia is divorcing me. She's with another man. And she's expecting his child. What? Whose child? Probably an English lord's child. I don't know whose it will be. And I brought Tam Rico and Mari with me. Mom. She's alive. But it's a very long story. We're coming to you. When they entered the house. Dolores was as pale as a ghost. But she regained her composure. Hello. Sonora Rubio. Mari said softly. Oh my god. Darling. Dolores grabbed Mariana and held her close. Both of them finally burst into tears and. Somehow eased the tension of the situation. And here's Babwa. That's grandma in Georgia. And I remember how to say grandma in Georgia. Dolores smiled through her tears. Tam Rico. Come in. You're my only mother-in-law. Albeit X. I didn't get another one. An hour later. A table was set with wine brought from Georgia. Surprisingly. Mom and Grandma quickly found common ground. While Paolo and Mariana went to open the hiding place. The ring with malachite surrounded by tiny diamonds was indeed there. They took the box and brought it into the large room. Here. How does it open? We're afraid to break it. Mari said and placed the precious item on the table. Just a moment. Tam Rico replied. She took out the ring. Turned it in her hands. Pressed a button. And the ornament opened. A pink radiance burst into their eyes. Dazzling them with its incredible light. Oh my god. It's the Parisian. At that moment. The doorbell rang. Mom. Are you expecting someone? 
No. Who could I be waiting for? Who's there? You're flooding us. Who are we flooding? Dolores answered. Opening the door. A few seconds before that. Paolo felt danger. But it was too late. At the threshold stood Senor Esteban. Silvia's husband. Mariana's aunt. And behind him. Two hooligans. Well. Hello there. Girls and boys too. You've done well. Especially you. Mari. How skillfully you've manipulated everyone around you. Manipulated who? What are you doing here? And where's aunt? Mariana asked. Your aunt is knitting winter hats. Even though in California. Where I bought her a small house. They're not really necessary. It's. Very hot there. But for a woman of her age. It's a perfect pastime. Please give me that beautiful ring with the pink stone inside. He reached out his hand. But Tam Rico managed to quickly snap the ring shut. Oh. You old scoundrel. I'll. And you'll be left empty-handed. Only I can open this ring. If you try to force it open. You'll damage the stone. What's going on? Uncle David? Oh. Nothing much. Niece. The client who came to you with the order for the ring is my sister. We've been searching for this unique piece for a while. And we decided to involve some young agency to do it. Professional detectives would have figured everything out in an instant. And then we would have ended up with nothing. To get close to the ring, I even had to marry your foolish aunt. All this story with your car accident. Funeral. And mental institution was my idea. Pretty cool. Huh. I forgot to mention that before I became a businessman. I was. How can I put it mildly? The director of a criminal organization. I had a few dozen tough guys at my disposal. My own intelligence. My infantry. But most of our wonderful company ended up behind bars. I managed to escape with new documents and move to the USA. My sister was already living there. And she became a close friend to Schneider. The Jewish idiot fell so in love with Maya that he was ready for any nonsense. Well. Almost any. Unexpectedly. Mariana leaped from her spot and lunged at Uncle David like a tigress. She clawed at his face. Scratching his cheeks and then his hair. Taken by surprise. The man fell to the floor. The hooligans were reaching out to her. But suddenly, a special forces unit burst into the apartment. Get down. The soldiers commanded. Prying Mari off her torn apart victim. Should we too? Without a hint of panic. Princess Shavenkly asked with composure. That could have made English aristocrats envious. A middle-aged man entered the room and introduced himself. Colonel Samuel Duran. Special unit. Good evening to all. Will you open the ring for me? It's still a historical value. A rarity. Princess Tam Rico Shads. Paolo's grandmother. Answered him in the same tone. Of course. My dear. Just show me your documents. Please. The officer smiled at the corners of his lips. While they conversed. The specialists lifted Uncle David and his hooligans and escorted them out. Tam Rico discreetly snapped the latch again. And the Parisian dazzled everyone present. Take it. Colonel. And tell us what really happened and. How you saved us from these hungry hyenas. Tam Rico asked while puffing on her pipe. Wait. What about my aunt? If he's a bandit. What did he do to her? Don't worry. She's completely unaware of the situation. He didn't inform her. He probably did have some feelings for her. Or maybe he simply didn't see any threat in her. 
We've already contacted her. She's flying here. We need her testimony. After all, they lived together for more than five years. And, by the way, we informed her that you, Mariana, are alive. But how did you know that? I live under false documents. Speaking of documents, we will help you restore all your rights and return to the world of the living. As for finding the operation, it took years to develop. We've been looking for this Uncle David of yours for a long time. And as for your being alive, we learned about that from our agent. She had been discreetly keeping an eye on you. Since you left for the USA and saw you being taken out of the house unconscious, put into a car, and driven to the airport. That's why the fake funeral immediately raised her suspicions. After we opened the coffin and found a huge doll inside, it became clear that you had indeed been taken somewhere. Your uncle, being a master of such tricks, indicated that operatives from the USA helped trace a lead. But you were no longer in the hospital. We accidentally found out that you had been in the monastery. Remember when you left the monastery for canvas and paints? I went once a month. Yes. Of course. And your former curator, Captain Eva Delgado, happened to be in the same city on assignment at that time. To avoid scaring you off and to figure out where you lived. She discreetly planted a bug in your bag. That's how we could listen to you and understand that you were not in danger. Well. The rest is technicalities. Did you also fly to Georgia with us? Of course. We didn't know what your Uncle David was capable of. But how did he track me down? I can't tell you that. It's classified information. Maybe someday. But who is he? This David? Four pairs of eyes were fixed on the colonel. Despite the fact that the clock showed it was already two in the morning. He decided that these people had the right to know the truth right now. His name is Alex Ticker. Nicknamed Tick. He really was the leader of a criminal group in the 90s. He excelled in theatrically staged crimes and personal theatrics. When he fled abroad, he took a stash with him on which he built his business. And such things are not forgiven even after many years. As we say, there's no statute of limitations for crime. He was found in America and presented with a bill. Somehow, he learned about the Paris stone and offered the gem. With the condition that his transgressions would be forgiven. And the entire debt to the Brotherhood would be written off. So, the ring was vital for Tick's survival. Tick. Criminals. Oh my god. Muttered Paolo and downed a glass of brandy. Tam Rico looked at him and did the same. After her. Dolores and Mari did too. Colonel. Are you with us? Will you stay? Paolo asked. Thank you. But no. I still have work at the office. We have a flexible work schedule. Replied Colonel Duran. Mariana and the Shad's family didn't sleep until morning. Discussing what had happened. Mari. Where did you learn to latch onto someone's face like that? A slightly tipsy Paolo asked. I don't know. Really, I don't know how it happened. I felt so upset for Aunt Sylvia. She had so many suitors. And she chose that scoundrel. After getting some sleep. Everyone gathered and went to the airport to meet Sylvia. Mariana was noticeably nervous. Finally. She spotted a familiar figure approaching. Only the woman's head was shaking from side to side. And Mariana realized she was sobbing uncontrollably. She hadn't seen Mariana yet. The girl didn't wait for her to get closer. She rushed toward her Auntie Sylvie. Sonora VZ. Raised her head upon hearing the familiar voice. Dropped her bag from her hands. And rushed toward Mariana. My girl. 
Dear Lord. You really are alive. When they called me. I thought it was some cruel joke or that they'd start extorting money. Let's go home. I haven't sold your apartment. Your paintings. Your things, they're all there. At this point. She saw Paolo. Dolores. And Tam Rico. Paolo had driven them to the old apartment. Then retrieved their belongings from the rented one. Handed over the keys. And returned home. He understood that Mariana and Sylvia needed to talk and recover from all of this. Then came the investigation. Endless interrogations. Sylvia gave her testimony. She didn't go to court. Julia sent the divorce papers. And Mariana and Paolo submitted their application to the registry office again. But they decided to celebrate their wedding in Green Cape, according to all Georgian traditions. Thank goodness there was no metro. And all the secrets had already been revealed. They arrived in Zainsk. They were already husband and wife. They decided to have the wedding ceremony in a small local church. Sister Evangeline. Of course. Sylvia. Dolores. And Colonel Duran agreed to accompany them. Senor Duran had been coming over to Dolores Vargas's place frequently after that incident. They were peers from the same era of poets and physicists. They found each other interesting. Their interests initially revolved around theaters and exhibitions. But then, they smoothly transitioned to personal matters. By age, Duran had long since become a retiree. Especially since, in his line of work, people retire earlier than civilians. But he didn't have a family. His wife had died young, leaving him with a daughter. And he never remarried. Irene, his daughter, had grown up a long time ago. And late love had come to the stern solitary wolf. Paolo was incredibly happy for his mom. When they arrived, Tam Rico greeted them with her ever-present pipe in hand. And Vang approached Dolores, looking straight into her eyes. He said, Forgive me, daughter. Everyone makes mistakes. I forgave you a long time ago. Senor Shads. Let's go and marry off our children. The village celebrated for five days. At the wedding. No one had married so grandly in a long time. A true princess had become a rarity in the village. But the youth. Like Tam Rico and Vang's son had scattered. And the grandchildren were born in the city. Celebrating their events like city folks. Sylvia had a very hard time dealing with them. Break up with Uncle David and his deception. Thus. She sat at the wedding. Unusually sad and lost in thought. I've never seen such Mayo's roses in my life. She heard someone say by her ear. She turned around. Standing next to her was a man, who looked like a real Jijit in traditional attire, even though he was white-haired. Gotzi. The special pouches for cartridges. On his chest were shining with real silver. His choco was adorned with the family crest. A leopard holding a fox and its teeth against a blue background. Along with the motto, Courage will defeat cunning in Gioran. Despite his age, the man looked very impressive. In his hands, he held a glass of red wine. At the wedding, they were not only drinking white wine. Such a celebration was considered one of the most important holidays. Sylvia was rendered speechless by the magnificence of the Jijit who had appeared. Allow me to introduce myself. Zet Shatz. A prince. Sylvia. A ballerina from the Grand Theater and the bride's aunt. Unexpectedly replied to herself. Really? I was wondering where I've seen you. Well. If I'm a rose. Then probably in the garden. Sylvia chuckled. 
An hour later, they were all laughing, drinking wine, and dancing. By the way, the newlyweds were also dressed in traditional costumes. And they looked great in them. During this time, Mari had regained a healthy complexion and the softness of her skin. She looked incredible. Come with me. Tam Rico said to the newlyweds. She led them into a small room in the house. Where they had never been before. Icons were hanging on the walls. And a Bible lay there. She picked it up. I bless you. My children. Live in harmony. Then she took out a small box. Opened it. And inside were two silver rings with red rubies. One for a man and one for a woman. These are for you. This is also a Sharat's family heirloom. And it's not a secret but a genuine one. These rings belonged to your great-great-grandparents. Paolo and Mariana accepted the gift. Bowing deeply to Tam Rico. How grateful they were to God. That everything had turned out so well. Ahead of them was a happy and eventful life.